All right, y'all. We are talking the pleasure trap today. Hey everybody, this is Dylan. I am freeze drying basil. Uh, as you saw, I have a forest of basil out there, which actually is even t more, it turns out, than I realized because I just cut this out and it did nothing. It did not even put a dent in it. So I have way more basil than I know what to do with. But what I'm doing right now is I'm going to pick off all the good leaves. This will all go to the compost and then I'm going to rinse these, spin them dry, which is gonna take forever, and then grind it up in the food processor, and then put it on these trays and freeze dry it in the freeze dryer. So it comes out like this nice, light, it's like a dried herb, but the regular dehydrated is uses heat and stuff, so it it's, doesn't behave the same way when you rehydrate it. When you rehydrate this, it's like adding fresh basil to a sauce or you can use do a, a pesto with it. And it's really amazing stuff. So it will preserve this basil for 25 years in a Mylar bag. And so it's really, really cool. And so we can use basil all year round as if we have fresh basil growing even though it's freeze dried. So that's what I'm working on now. I don't know what I'm gonna do with the rest of it because there's going to be, a, there's a ton of basil out there. So I'm gonna freeze dry as much as I possibly can and maybe I'll like start selling it or something. I don't know. I had not thought that far down the road yet because, well, the reason I planted that much basil was simply because I was having trouble growing anything in the summer in the aquaponics out there. And so I got frustrated and said, fine, if you wanna do that, I'll just grow the one thing that I know how to grow. And so we planted basil in the entire thing which doesn't look like that much until it actually starts growing. And sure enough, the joke is on me. But whatever, we'll just deal with it. Um, maybe I'll go and run some down to my neighbors and be neighborly and friendly. We'll see, we'll see. All right, so anyway, we're doing a cook bong. I wanna talk more about the pleasure trap. Um, I know a lot of you watching have probably already read it, but every time I go back and read it, I learn something new. Or I refresh myself on something that I may have let slip through the cracks or I forgot about. So stick with us. We are talking about chapter seven in the pleasure trap and that's where doctors Lyle and Goldhammer talk about the law of satiation and how hunger works and how our body reacts to uh, our feelings of hunger. But anyway, the book was by both Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer. Two of my absolute favorite doctors, um, who I'm hoping to meet later this month. I'm going to go to True North, where both of those doctors work, and I'm going to do a stay there, because I always talk about True North, and I figure if I'm gonna talk about it on my videos, I should probably experience it for myself. Okay, so in chapter seven of The Pleasure Trap, Dr. Lyle, spoiler alert, what he's really going to do in this chapter is prove to us that there is absolutely no need to count calories if we just do it right. So I wanna talk about that. He says at the beginning of the chapter, when have we ever seen, if we have a, a wild animal in its natural environment, eating its natural food, and it's got all the food that it wants, right? Access to all of its normal foods that it could possibly eat. Uh, have we ever seen that animal become overweight? Or even underweight? And the answer is no, um, and he calls this the law of satiation. He says that in a natural setting of caloric abundance, animals will consume exactly the right amount of food to maintain optimal bodily function for their entire lifetimes. And this makes intuitive sense because if you think about it, all animals are descendants of creatures that got it right. That's why we're here today. They're, these are animals that forever have eaten the right amount of food, they've drunk the right amount of water, they've gotten the right amount of sleep, and we've breathed the right amount of air in order to maintain our lives in a healthy way. Um, we see animals in the wild doing this constantly. So then, don't you think it's kind of strange that we have so many millions of Americans that go around 
manually counting their calories to control just the right amount of food that they're eating when we have literally trillions of animals currently alive on the planet that are completely automatically doing this without any knowledge of what a calorie even is. Don't you think that's kind of curious? Yeah, it is. It is. I'll give you a hint. It is. It is very strange that we think we have to count calories when really we're just not in our natural environment. The kicker here is that these animals that are doing well are living in their natural environment. If you feed an animal a super ultra rich diet, they're going to become overweight because you've no, you're no longer feeding them the foods that we've evolved to eat. And you can already see that the simple solution is to get ourselves into our natural environment, to block out all the noise and the junk and eat the right foods. So let me dig a little deeper. So the authors then present to us this theoretical chimpanzee. Now a chimpanzee eats a 2000 calorie a day diet. And this chimp that we're going to talk about now is one that we've just made up that's going to eat 20 too few calories per day, which is 1%. So instead of it eating 100% of its diet, it's eating 99% of its diet. And a chimp over the course of its entire lifetime eats about 100,000 pounds of food. So we're gonna take 1,000 pounds of that food away for that entire life, which translates to 400,000 calories less than what it should be eating. Obviously that chimp is not going to survive. So you can see that eating the right amount of food is not something that we can just control with math and calculating. It, our bodies need to tell us how much to eat. That's the only way that we're going to eat exactly 100% of the calories that we need to be eating throughout the course of our lives. Now, the, the authors aren't saying that every single day we eat exactly 100% of what we need to be eating, but they do go on to explain how our bodies uh, make up for it. So if we have a day where we're only eating 98 or 99 percent of what we should be eating, well there are other days in our future where we're eating a little more than 100 percent to make up for this difference. So it's not, the point isn't that we're eating exactly 100 percent of what we should be eating every day. That's, that's also not possible. But the point here is that when we're in our natural setting, our bodies are going to tell us exactly how much we need to eat and it's going to be exactly perfect. So now if we take that same chimp and we feed it 1% too much food every day for its entire life, doing the same math, we're gonna find that that chimpanzee is 100 pounds overweight. This has never happened in nature before. It's never, it's been researched and never observed. So we know that this is not going to happen. A chimp is not going to spend every day eating 20 extra calories and then becoming overweight. So why is that? What, how could this be? I mean, the chimp doesn't go around counting ba bananas. It doesn't count bites of banana and, and in order to determine how much food that it's supposed to eat. It just eats when it's hungry and it doesn't eat when it's not hungry. And if he eats a little too much one day, he's probably gonna eat a little bit less the next day. And if he eats too little one day, he's gonna eat a little more the next day and make up for it because that's what his body is gonna tell him to do. So it turns out humans follow the same law of satiation that the chimpanzee follows and every other wild animal in its natural environment. The problem is we're not living in our natural environment. And just as we can defy gravity by getting into an airplane, we also can defy the law of satiation by creating ultra-rich foods like high-fat foods and refined carbohydrates that trick our bodies into performing the wrong math so that we're not eating the right amount of calories that we've evolved to eat, we're not eating the natural foods, and we become overweight. So the result now is that we have people that are constantly trying to fight their hunger drives because their hunger drives are being artificially stimulated by unnatural foods that are not from our natural environment. So we're having to think about the food that we eat and trying to avoid the ones that we shouldn't eat or count calories so that we can keep eating the food that we shouldn't eat. And this is obviously not a solution. The issue is with what we eat, not how much of it we eat. Our hunger drive is our motivation behind eating and it involves both pleasure seeking components and pain avoidance. So 
Pleasure seeking would be like when we know that we like the taste of food. So we eat it because we're seeking pleasure because we like the taste. Also, it would be our digestion which releases chemicals that tell us that the food we've eaten was good. We made the right choice in eating it. And then pain avoidance would be like if we are feeling pain because we're hungry, we're going to try to avoid that pain by eating food. And if we're eating and eating and eating and we get full, our pain avoidance will also tell us to stop eating or I'm going to hurt you. I'm going to give you pain so that you stop eating. But these natural systems have been hijacked by the unnatural foods that we've been eating. These systems were evolved to work with our natural environment, with our natural foods, and if we're not going to eat our natural food anymore, then these systems that we've evolved to use to maintain a healthy lifestyle aren't going to work for us anymore. And that is what is happening with the standard American diet. Okay, so Dr. Lyle goes on to talk about this, some of the specific mechanisms that go into this whole pleasure seeking, pain avoidance, when to eat, when to stop eating thing. So I want to talk about those next. Let's give this a rinse and go get some more basil and keep on plucking. Okay, so the first mechanism in our bodies that tells us when to eat and when not to eat is our stretch sensation. Um, this is the one that we feel that we're most aware of because we straight up feel it when we are eating. When we're hungry, our stretch receptors say, hey, you're hungry, let's give him a little bit of pain in the stomach and tell this person to eat. And then, likewise, when you're full, this same mechanism tells you that you have filled up your stomach and you need to stop eating so that you don't compromise your health. Essentially, it's our stretch receptors that are measuring the physical bulk of the food that we eat. That's telling us how much food we are eating. But we need more than that because that is not telling us anything about the food that we are eating. So the second mechanism that works in tandem with our stretch receptors would be our nutrient sensation. And that is our body's ability to basically calculate the caloric density of the food we're eating. So in other words, if we're eating calorically dense food from our natural environment that isn't completely filling us up and activating our stretch receptors, we might still be told by our nutrient receptors to stop eating it, that we've gotten enough calories and it's time to quit even though you're not full. So this is the nutrient sensation. So if you remember from my calorie video where I talk about caloric density of foods, if you eat a bulk of uh, raw vegetables, that's like 100 calories per pound. If you eat fruit, that's maybe 300 calories per pound of fruit. If you eat the more calorically dense foods like the starches, the foods that really fuel us, uh, and give us energy, that, that's more like five to 600 calories per pound. And then nuts and seeds and other overt fats is even more than that. So we've got this nutrient sensation in our bodies that is essentially calculating the nutrients, the calories that we're eating for us. It's telling us, okay, you've eaten really calorically dense food from your natural environment and you should stop eating that now or you need to eat a little bit more because you're bulking up on foods that have a low caloric density and so we're going to make you hungrier sooner so that you get some more calories. This is happening to us all the time. It's why when we eat a huge salad, fill up totally on salad, we're like hungry an hour later. Uh, it's completely normal to feel that way because we've eaten uh, foods that are very low in caloric density. And so then our body says, uh, you should get some more calorically dense food, maybe some starches on your next meal, and you're going to feel better. You're going to feel more full, and we're going to be able to carry on a little bit better. So that is what's happening with the nutrient sensation. So this means that if we were to eat, say, four ounces of nuts or four ounces of apples, the four ounces of nuts are going to make us feel more satiated. They won't necessarily make us feel more physically full because that's, not, that's our stretch receptors and we're not talking about that. We're talking about our nutrient receptors. We're going to feel more satiated or satisfied from a hunger standpoint if we eat four ounces of nuts than if we eat four ounces of apple. And that makes perfect sense because we want to feel more full if we eat those more calorically rich foods. So you can see how our nutrient sensation and our stretch sensation work together to control our appetite. They tell us when we should eat, when we should stop eating, 
but it turns out this is just an estimation. We can still override those mechanisms even in our natural environment eating the right kind of food. We can still get a little bit fat. So we have this third mechanism that's essentially there to check our math. When we are getting a little bit fat, this mechanism activates and it slows down our hunger drive a little bit. Dr. Lyle calls this the YOWL circuits and that stands for you're overweight, eat less. So what the YAL circuits do is they're going to take the edge off of your hunger drive, essentially. They're going to help you reach satiety maybe 10% early, for example, so that for a little bit you're going to eat less than what your normal daily calorie intake is in order to reduce some of that extra body weight and get back to the healthy weight that you need to stay at to maintain a happy, healthy life. So those are the YAL circuits. And as soon as you get back to that healthy weight, these YAL circuits were, will go back to quiet, will turn off, and you'll just go back to using your stretch sensation and your nutrient sensation to estimate how much food you should be eating. So it's these three mechanisms all working together that allow us in our normal environment with caloric abundance, as much normal food as we want to maintain our weight at a healthy spot. We never observe animals overweight because of these mechanisms that allow us to eat exactly the right amount. This is why we never ever have to count calories if we're eating the right food. If you eat the right food, you don't count calories ever. When you're hungry, you eat. When you're not hungry, you don't eat. If you're not at the weight that you want to be at right now and you feel like you're losing weight too slowly, well then you might have to go to some more extremes that we wouldn't normally have to do in our natural environment. Maybe you're going to do intermittent fasting or something like that in order to control your weight. Um, but that's usually just going to be a temporary measure. If you're eating the right food and you've reached your goal weight, then you're going to be able to maintain it by eating just the right foods all the time. And if you're not at your goal weight now, you still don't need to probably do anything very drastic. Um, you just need to go back to eating the right foods like we were supposed to do. And it may take a little bit more time than you want it to, but you're going to level out. You're going to reach your goal weight. Um, remember how many years you spent becoming overweight, gaining weight, being in the place that you don't want to be. It took a really long time to get there and it might take a little bit of time to get back to where you want to be. So you got to be patient with yourself and understand that your body is going to lead you the right direction if you give it the right food. So up till now I've talked mostly about how everything would work in harmony in our natural environment, but we haven't talked about what is really causing these mechanisms to fail. These mechanisms aren't telling us when to stop eating the way that they historically always have told us. And why is that? So the reason that our satiety mechanisms are failing us so badly is because our modern diet is artificially concentrated. We add oil to all of the healthy foods that we should be eating and we add animal products to all of the healthy foods that we should be eating. And that is tricking the system. Likewise, we have refined carbohydrates where all of the plant fibers are stripped away and we've got processed sugar in the form of soft drinks and all that garbage. And these items, these food items, if you want to call them that, are tricking our body into eating too much and to not stop when we're supposed to be stopping. So you know how we always talk about 80-10-10 when we're talking about macronutrients. The macros are carbohydrates, fat, and protein. Those are the three components of all of food, um, as well as, you know, fiber, water, whatever. But 80-10-10 means that our ideal diet has been observed to be about 80% whole starches, carbohydrates, 10% fat, 10% protein. I'm pretty close to this. I, I don't really, I don't put my food into that chronometer app that analyzes the percentages and your calories and all that. But once in a while, I'll throw some foods in there to see what kind of a diet I have. Um, so that I can talk to, talk to you about it like I am now. And I think I'm roughly around 75% carbs and then maybe like 12 or 13% fat, 12 or 13% protein, something like that. Um, I'm sure it changes every day and I rely on my body to keep it in check and right where it needs to be. And it's been working out perfectly. But the point of my mentioning macros is to say that is because I want to compare to the way that most people eat now and how our diet historically was. Historically, it was pretty much unheard of 
that our ancestors would have ever had a fat content in their diets as high as 20%. Like I said, 80-10-10, 10% fat. Um, the highest it may ever have gotten was still less than 20% fat in our historical diet. I want to say that humans really are technically omnivores. I know that we vegans like to say that humans are herbivores and we were never ate meat, but humans actually did eat really small amounts of wild game in our evolution. Uh, but this meat was like 15% fat and in, like I said, it was eaten very rarely. But now it's not rare and the meat that humans are eating is hormone injected and is more like 60 to 70% fat. So it is not the same thing as we used to eat. For that reason, compared to then, we are herbivores. We are not evolved to eat the crap meat that is available to us now. And advocating for humans to go out and hunt wild game um, is just simply stupid. It's not sustainable, it makes no sense. So for all intents and purposes, I do consider humans to be herbivores. But from an evolutionary standpoint, we are technically omnivores and humans did eat this wild game on very rare occasions that had like 15% fat. So eggs, dairy, meat, fried foods, um, all have a fat percentage of like 35 to 80%. And when humans lived on a diet that was around 10% fat, and they'd have some of these higher fat foods like once in a while, we were maintaining an average of around 10% and never as high as 20%. Now the standard American diet is like 40% fat or more, maybe like even as high as 80% fat if you're consuming all of these animal products consistently and fried foods and all of that. So you can see that we're eating a diet that is not in our natural environment. Likewise, many plant foods are now highly processed all of the natural fiber that accompanies the plant foods that we should be eating is being stripped away and we're left with artificially calorically dense foods that are not part of our natural environment. The plant foods with the fiber is what we need to protect our digestive system. So eating all of these uh, fiber-free refined carbohydrates is leading to diarrhea, constipation, irritable bowel syndrome, colitis, colon cancer, all of these diseases that are now very common that were never common before. It's really important that we remember that we've evolved to eat these plant foods, these whole plant foods that include not only the nutrition that we need, but also the fiber that maintains a healthy digestive system. And when we start to mess with the food and break it down into its components, we're gonna get really sick. And we have been getting really sick. So our three satiety mechanisms do have the ability to calculate the caloric density of the food that we're eating, but not when it's ultra concentrated like these scientifically created poisons that we are eating on a regular basis now. Our bodies know that they're concentrated, obviously, but they don't know that they're quite as concentrated as they really are. And that is what's allowing us to continue wanting more. We're activating all the pleasure centers of our brain and nothing is ever turning them off. So we keep eating all of the food that we're not supposed to be eating and uh, we get fat and we get sick. So the only real solution then is to be aware of this, to make ourselves aware of the truth and to consciously choose not to eat the foods that we were not evolved to be eating. That is of critical importance if we want to be healthy in our lives going forward and if we want to remain at a healthy weight as well. So that's really it, it is that simple. All we have to do is eat the food that we know our bodies were built to eat, that our bodies can tell us when we are hungry. They'll do all the right things if we just only focus on the foods that we're supposed to be eating. You'll reach the health that you wanna be at. You won't get sick like so many people are. And, um, and that's all there is to it. One thing that bothers me in our society is that people that are overweight are shamed into thinking that they are the way they are simply because of some sort of psychological problem that they have. Um, so society and professionals tell us that in order to lose that weight we need to slow down or not emotionally eat or chew our food 10,000 times before we swallow or you know just get, fix our psychological problems but, and, and then it'll all work out. Well, 
it really bothers me when I hear crap like that because being fat is not a psychological problem. We all have the same machinery that we need to live happy, healthy lives, and we need to be told the truth about why we have become overweight. And it has nothing to do with our emotions. It has only to do with the food that we are choosing to put in our bodies. And in many cases, I don't feel like people are choosing it because they're unaware of the fact that the food they're putting into their bodies is absolute poison. So we're not given a very good choice initially until we decide that we want to start digging in to books like The Pleasure Trap and uh, find the truth. I eat emotionally, I feel like, every day. I have emotional things going on that lead me to eat more. I overeat all the time. I binge eat some nights. I, I have all of the same emotional problems that all of the overweight people in our, in our modern society are told that they have that's causing them to be overweight. And it's simply not the thing. You are not fat because of a psychological problem that you have. We simply become fat because we are conditioned by society to eat the wrong food. It's advertised to us, it's told to us everywhere, our children are forced to drink milk in schools, and, and all of this, you know, the USDA guidelines for healthy food and all of this stuff. It's all of the people in our lives that we're supposed to be able to trust with our, with our health are telling us the wrong things. We're being lied to. And oftentimes we're being lied to people that don't even know that they're lying to us because they too have been brainwashed into eating all of the junk that's making us totally unhealthy. So when I eat emotionally, instead of eating a baking sheet covered with Pillsbury poison or chicken wings, I will eat a baking sheet of oven baked french fries that are lightly seasoned to perfection and I'll have this delicious snack with maybe a couple dipping sauces that perhaps have a little bit of added salt or sugar or whatever but in very small amounts just to keep the food palatable for me and so I'll emotionally eat, emotionally eat on things that maintain my health. I might get a little bit more calories on a day where I emotionally eat than a day where I don't, but I'm relying on my body's naturally evolved satiety mechanisms to tell me when it's time to pull back the reins and take it easy or stop eating or be done for the day or night or whatever. We all have mental issues that we work with day to day, day in, day out. We struggle with some things for a couple weeks, we work on them, we fix them, we move on. We have other issues come up. It's all natural. You are not fat because of your mental issues. All you must do is fix the food. Well, your world. Anyway, I hope that explanation was helpful. I really love The Pleasure Trap. I've read it at least a couple times, you know, by chapter by chapter when something is relevant to what I'm working on right now. And for me, this was. Um, at this time, so I was rereading this in order to talk to you about it today. I encourage you to get a copy. I'm going to put a link to the book uh, in the description of this video. It's only like eight bucks new on Amazon. You can probably find it uh, used any number of different ways. So get hold of the book, feel better about where you are, and start learning about the truth so that you can eat right and take control of your life. That is what it all comes down to. So anyway, we're going to finish up this basil. I am still plucking it. I'm going to rinse it, rinse, uh, rinse it, dry it, and then grind it up in the food processor and spread it out on these trays and then throw it in the freeze dryer. And that will be a day. I don't know what the hell I'm going to do with all this basil, but I'll come up with something. Believe me, I'll come up with something. Thanks for watching. I'll see you on the next video. Off we go to basil land. Bye. Oh, this is gonna take forever.